First, though, let's talk about the Lakers getting eliminated from the playoffs last night briefly, but more spring this forward to where this goes from here. So this will be the Lakers offseason preview. I've got one of our handy pages, as usual. We've got some videos. we got some clips we're going to run through, everything like that. Not really run through. They'll just play. Um, I've kind of locked up everything that we need to know here. So let's start with the last series that just occurred with Denver. Denver eliminated the Lakers in four or no four to one. So in five games, the Lakers had led by nine in the second half of the final four games. They led by at least nine in every game of the series. My take on the Lakers. And I posted this last night is that they are way closer to competing and contending than what I think anyone really likes to say because it's the Lakers and people don't like the Lakers and everything like that. Do you think the Lakers are a couple of moves away from contending like I do? Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. I mean, at the end of the day, we talked about this going back to the regular season when we talked about the Lakers, when we even talked about the Warriors in terms of what their record was. And it it wasn't bad. They didn't have bad seasons. And so I think they're close enough that you don't just say, oh my gosh, like there's a team we're going to talk about today. It's like, what's, what's it, what is the path here? Like, what, what do they do? But with this team, it's you bring back LeBron. I know we'll talk about it. AD, obviously big Austin Reeves fan here. So obviously I'm saying Austin Reeves, but then how do you build it out? Like, that's what I want to know. And that's what I'm sure we're going to discuss. Sam is how do we build it out? Cause you can't run it. We can't say this was pretty good. And if we run it back, it'll be okay. And good enough next year. It's close enough to go. There is a path, but we have to find yeah. that path and make sure we hit on it. I agree. I was pretty impressed with what I saw from the Lakers in the playoffs. I thought that they played effective basketball against the team that I think is the favorite to win the title. They contended with this team the whole way. They battled, they scratched, they clawed. I thought that they really kind of overcame coaching and we'll certainly talk about Darvin Ham and some of the decisions he made throughout the season, let alone in this series. I think that with LeBron and Anthony Davis, with Austin Reeves locked in certainly long-term, I feel like they're kind of okay. Like I, I I know that people want to do the sky is falling with the Lakers thing. I don't see it. I, I really think that they can contend as soon as next year. They just need to do some things on the margins more than anything. And that's assuming that LeBron returns and, you know, maybe we'll talk about that in a second, but you, I, I'm, I'm okay with this. Like if I'm them, I'm trying to largely run back what we saw this year and make moves on the margins more than anything, I guess is where I'm at. Not like the big Trey Young swing, not the big, you know, star swing. I think they've got the stars. I think that they just need like really good, effective role players that give them two way options. Yes. And that would be okay. No, th- that's where I'm at as well. Again, you have LeBron, you have AD. Uh, again, I'm I'm a huge Austin Reese fan, so I, I'm going to lump him in there as well. At the end of the day, you have to make a decision on, well, I guess he's going to make part of this decision, but D'Angelo Russell. And he did score 18 points a game. He shot over 42% from three on really high volume. How do you replace that? What do you do with Rui? Like, I would like to upgrade that other fifth starting spot. What do you do off the bench? You know, Torian Prince, are you going to count on that again? What is your backup big situation behind AD? They have a draft pick. You know, so that I think they have moves they need to make, in my opinion. They have to get these things right with whatever options and avenues and mechanisms they have to get there. I wouldn't want to just say, hey, let's bring all these guys back and same health is going to happen and D'Lo is going to shoot this good from three again and Gabe Vincent isn't going to be hurt all year and we'll just everything will be fine. But I agree with you in that I don't think they have to go star hunting to fix it. 
they have to win on the margins. And then it comes down to, do you think the Lakers in their front office can win on the margins this offseason? You're muted, Sam. Before we get to winning on the margins, let's talk about LeBron and his decision coming up as well as, you know, maybe Russell and things like that. So yep. LeBron spoke on his decision to not speak last night about whether or not he'll be back. Let's hear from him. Thought at all that, you know, this could have been your last game with the Lakers. Um, I'm not going to answer that. Appreciate it. <laughs> says a lot, right? That says something to me. The the pause there that is so condensed. I often don't take away a lot from players in moments like this. And I don't really take away from a lot from LeBron there. I understand why people do it. I think there are just so many reasons why that answer can come in that moment. You just came off the court after a disappointing loss in a playoff series, right? Maybe one that you didn't expect to win, but still disappointing nonetheless when you're LeBron James. You have a lot going on. You're a free agent this offseason, potentially, if you want to be. You have a son entering the NBA in Bronny James where his whole situation seems so complicated and convoluted, right? You've got a team and a coaching staff that is ripe for change in, in a lot of different ways. Honestly, you could be deciding, Hey, I need to like keep some leverage over the organization here because I am turning 40 next year and I want to contend for a title and I don't want to restart. So I need to make sure and keep the leverage as high as humanly possible for any circumstance that arises. I just think there are a lot of different ways to interpret that i believe that woge went on tv today and said like the hope and like basically the hope for the lakers and like everything like that is that he will sign a two to three year extension with the lakers that makes sense to me i think certainly he's an all nba player still i think he can be a real dude on a playoff team we saw that throughout the playoffs although I will say that the great moments for LeBron, where, where I'm at on LeBron right now, is the great moments for him are still among the league's best, point blank. There are times where nobody can touch that dude. However, there are stretches through games where his... I would guess some semi-diminished physical skills compared to where they had been previously throughout his career start to work against him. And he goes through decision-making lulls throughout games that can hinder the Lakers for stretches. But when he is on, he's still among the best of the best. I would agree. He's still an all-NBA player, to be the clear. Hi the highs are as high as you would want still the lows are low like the consistency right like there, there's just bigger gap in those I, I think about just the notes i've made over the last couple of weeks in lakers games and how many layups he's just missed like that's just one single microcosm of what we're talking about here and, and i know we want to keep this on lebron but this is why i say the roster does need to change he can't sam lebron can't have to play 35 minutes a game 71 games next year for the Lakers just to get them into the play in. He, he's going to be worn down at the end of the day. That's what it's going to be at his age. We talked about this a little bit with Steph Curry. Even if it is a quote unquote 82 game player that gets buckets for them, they have to find a way to lower his usage in the regular season so that consistency can be higher in the postseason. And we don't see him getting worn down in the fourth quarter. I've listened again, I've referenced Tim Bontemps a couple times in a row now. He talked about, you know, the idea the Lakers should have lost the play-in game so then they could get the eight seed and all of that stuff. And one of his biggest things is this was the Lakers' best chance of beating the Nuggets because the longer it goes into the playoffs, the more war down LeBron is going to get and AD is going to get and all of that. And so if that's something we have to consider with LeBron, they have to find a way for his usage and wear and tear during the regular season to take a step back. 
I agree with you kind of across the board on that. I, I think that that's definitely right. They just need to limit the wear and tear on him. And I think that this is where the conversation about what they need to do this off season kind of comes up, right? They need to find a way to get more creation in the building from guards. And I feel like to me, you have to find guys who can actually like touch the paint more than anything. That to me would result in D'Angelo Russell departing from the Lakers. You have Austin Reeves on a three year, $42 million deal. I think Austin Reeves is like just a way better player than D'Angelo Russell. Like, I think he's just way more consistent. I think he's better defensively. I think he's a better passer. I, like, I just think he is a more effective third guy to have out there with LeBron and Anthony Davis than Russell is. I get it that Russell had like an incredible shooting stretch at the end of the year, but like, I just can't count on him in big games and I can't count on him against the Nuggets. And we have enough proof of that kind of, I thought Reeves did a really good job on Jamal Murray throughout the course of the series. Yeah, I, I just think that I trust him more than I trust D'Angelo Russell. At well, the end of say, the day. even if you want to say Russell has more offensively, which I think there's a conversation there because obviously it looks very different in how they do things stylistically, all of that. The Lakers trusted one of those two guys to guard Jamal Murray for five games. And I realize Murray had some crazy makes and game winners and all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, they never thought, oh, we're going to put D'Lo on Jamal Murray. That was task of Austin Reeves. And like you said, I thought he did a pre pretty decent job. So, uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. I just think that you probably need somebody who can actually like really touch the paint next to Reeves and next to LeBron at this stage. And for everything that Russell is, he's not really that guy. Yep. Here's what D'Angelo Russell said after their game regarding his potential to, you know, be back, not be back. When I signed my contract last year, I knew what position I was going to put myself in. So to be in that position now with a little leverage, I'll, I'll, I'll try to take advantage of it. <laughs> I mean, I guess he is. I guess he has leverage. Like on some level, right? But not really. <laughs> like he didn't play well in this series. That I don't... was amazing. I didn't see that. Wow. Yeah. I I think he has some leverage, but like I don't know if he has leverage on the Lakers necessarily. He might have like opt out leverage and like maybe go somewhere else. But I mean, wh where is he going to go is also a question for me for 18 million. Shout out the Pistons. Like, no, no, th th uh, listen, I was going to say, Sam, like, there are Pistons fans who I really trust, respect, like, all of it. Like, D'Angelo Russell comes up in conversations all the time. Now, it comes up in Malik Monk, D'Angelo Russell, Gary Trent Jr. Like, we have all of these different conversations, but I, I guarantee you there are many Pistons fans who would be very happy with the Pistons outbidding the Lakers to bring D'Angelo Russell to Detroit. And yeah. maybe, that's, maybe that's what he sees as leverage as, uh, as one of those teams, you know, th th that can do that, would do that. And, and look, Russell played really well at the end of the year here. Like, I, I do want to say like his last Absolutely. couple of months, he knocked down shots. He played effectively. It's just like, I don't trust him in big moments. <laughs> and like, maybe that's a me problem as opposed to a D'Angelo problem. I am wholly willing to admit that. Like, it could be that, you know, it's more on me than on him. Like in his last 41 games, D'Angelo Russell averaged 28, 20.8 20 points, 6.6 .6 assists versus only 2.2 .2 turnovers shot 45, 43, 88. The big question for me is like, do you trust D'Angelo Russell who is a career 36.9% three point shooter to make 43% of his threes moving forward? And I and don't. To, so yeah. To your point, we get into the playoffs and again, to the Austin Reeves versus D'Angelo Russell, Reeves averaged almost three more points per game than him on better from the field. And Austin didn't even shoot great from three, but Russell was at 32%. He only got to the free throw line in the entire playoffs two times 
in five, I, 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 yeah, this isn't counting the play in game. Yeah. Those stats just go into the cloud or something weird. I don't know where those stats go, but two times in five playoff games. So this all speaks to your point. We saw it in five games of this series. The only way I would feel real comfortable with the Lakers bringing D'Lo back is to do what I just said, where, hey, we think he can go get 18, 20 points a game, 18 to 22 a game during the regular season. But, Sam, we have an answer in the playoffs where we can lower his minutes and his usage in his role that player X, whoever that player is, I don't have a name, is going to be able to eat up those minutes when we get into a series against the Nuggets where you know it just doesn't work as well. Okay, so kind of looking at this holistically, let's say LeBron comes back for around the same number that he's currently slated to be on. Okay. Anthony Davis is locked into this, you know, extension that is essentially three more years, at least with the last year of a player option. Austin Reeves is locked in for two more years with a player option tacked on. Russell has this $18 million player option. They have Rui Achimura for two years, 35 million. Gabe Vincent for two years, 22 million. Jared Vanderbilt's extension kicks in next year, four years, 48 million. Jackson Hayes, Christian Wood, Cam Reddish, all those guys have minimum player options. I mean, like if I'm Jackson Hayes, I'm picking up that money. Uh, If I'm Cam Reddish and Christian Wood, like maybe I can get a minimum somewhere else, but. I'm probably locking in that money if I'm those guys, given the season they had. Torian Prince is an unrestricted free agent. He played too much this year, but like if he was the eighth man as opposed to like the fifth or sixth man that we saw Darvin Ham use him as this year, I think that would probably be fine. The question now for the Lakers as we're talking is what do you do if you're them now moving forward? We said at the top here that we think they're a little bit closer than where I think other people believe them to be. Who are some players, who are some types of players that you're trying to target this summer as you go down this road? Yeah, so I think the number one thing I would look for is a 3 and D wing, like a guy that can really space the floor and then really take those tough perimeter matchups that LeBron can't take all the time. Rui's too big for, you know, e- you know, even some that maybe Austin Reeves isn't that big enough for that, that just don't make as much sense for him. And then, like you said, a guard who can really pressure the paint, ideally would then be able to space the floor, or maybe he gives you another perimeter defender, right? Maybe it's a guard who really defends, also really pressures the paint, and then now Austin has more energy to do what I think he can do offensively. Like if I'm the Lakers, I'm going into next year, just assume, like let's run some more Austin AD pick and roll. Let's run some more Austin LeBron pick and roll, those type of things. But I think that three and D wing, like I just looked through the roster and I'm like, who is that player that you say, this guy can knock down 40% of his three point shots and he can really guard the heck out of people for us. It's, you know, Vanderbilt only does one of those things. Rui is kind of average at both of those things. They tried to play Cam Reddish for a while, and then he ended up out of the rotation. Who is that guy on the roster for them? I think that's number one thing they have to go find. So I had like a general idea for this that I'll put up on the screen now. I've been like trying to like toy with the idea of the Nets and the Lakers coming together on something. Okay. Okay. Because the Nets are in this weird amorphous roster situation. And if the Nets are going to go star hunting, they have enough assets to be able to do so. But it doesn't hurt necessarily to add more assets, I guess, to that kind of paradigm. So this is kind of the idea that I came up with. The Lakers get Dorian Finney-Smith and Dayron Sharp from the Nets. For Rui Achimura, to me, Dorian Finney-Smith is an upgrade on Rui because Dorian Finney-Smith can knock down shots and he's a better defender. The Lakers also give up Jalen hood Shafino, who did not have a great rookie season. Uh, That looks like a pick that could be not great for them. Sure. But trying to cash in on it maybe before, you know, things turn pear-shaped could be interesting. And then they have... 
either their 2024 or 2025 first round pick, depending on what the Pelicans decide to do. We'll talk about that in a second as well. Okay. As well as a second round pick. So basically, Rui, Jalen Hood, Shafino, a first, a second for Dorian Finney Smith and Dayron Sharp. The idea being Dayron Sharp physical can take on some like contact, be able to try and, you know, throw another body at Jokic in lineups with Anthony Davis, have it so Anthony Davis does not have to play a ton of center. Dayron Sharp has, you know, I think emerged as a rotation player in the NBA at this point. He played 15 minutes a game this year for Brooklyn. I've liked the flashes that we've seen, but only has one year left on his contract before he potentially gets paid. Uh, And then, you know, I think, again, like I think Finney Smith is just like a real upgrade for the Lakers. If they do this, you're now looking at a lineup of Reeves, whatever they do with the two, with uh, D'Angelo Russell, X, whoever, Finney Smith, and then, you know, LeBron and AD. And that's an interesting player to me yeah i like dayron sharp i think he would really fit uh recently we dropped a mock draft over on the basketball bulletin and trevor lane who covers the lakers for sb nation you know he, he took zach Eady, and i thought that was really interesting and it was just like a big physical post player who th- we gave the lakers the 17th pick in this obviously in this mock yeah the, the pelicans were going to defer to 2025 and He's like, you know, just a big physical big to take those matchups. I, I think Dayron Sharp, does, I, I like Dayron Sharp. I think he really rebounds. He's physical. Like maybe I, I think he passes well, like he underrated passer probably than what people would think. Defends. I, I think that would be a really nice big for them. And then again, if he pops off and plays really well, then, you know, you give him a, a, an extended contract. If it doesn't, like you say, it's just a one-year deal. Dorian Finney-Smith, I can see that. I would say in this scenario, then I would really be searching. And I guess I, my question would be, because I don't have like the cap sheet exactly. What's the path then to that two guard? And I need that two guard to really be able to defend and chase guys and be my perimeter stopper. Yeah, I agree. I think Finney Smith can take on some like, you know, bigger wings certainly Agreed. and can take on like smaller wings as well but probably more toward the bigger wing side, if anything. Uh, I, I like that deal for Brooklyn as well, because if you're Brooklyn, you're still trying to like prove to other organizations or in other stars around the league, potentially, that you're contending in some way, shape, or form, or that you're close enough to contention, right? So you only slightly downgrade from Finney Smith to Rui to pick up additional assets to potentially go out and move for a star right so like Rui I think actually fits really well with either of Cam Johnson or Mikhail Bridges on the court so like whenever you construct lineups right Rui can move back into that like sixth man role which is effective in some way shape or form and then you can bring him in for either one of those two and I think it moves somewhat effectively for Brooklyn uh, while getting them assets was kind of my idea. Um, other ideas that I had in terms of trades. Again, this is a team that you're going to have to like really search for. You're going to have to really like try and find answers for in terms of like the backcourt. I wouldn't be stunned if like Chris Paul's on this team next year, right? Like it yeah. seems like Chris Paul's contract will probably not be put into place with the golden state warriors chris paul obviously has a long-standing relationship with lebron james i didn't think chris paul played poorly this year it's just that you have to have chris paul in a circumstance where his minutes are again a bit more limited and you can kind of work him through the season right yep yeah no that's what I'm just trying to look at the free agents too. And it's like, so you have Kyle Lowry is there. Markel Fultz. Who was the other one? De'Anthony Melton. If Philly doesn't bring him back. I think Melton makes sense for them too, for what it's worth. But like, again, I want more of like a, like a pressure, like paint touch kind of guard at the end of the day. Yeah. 
than anything. Yeah. Like that that's really what I'm looking for here. Yeah, I would agree. And I don't know that did I see that guy as I just scroll through the list. The other interesting name that I tried to think about a little bit was Colin Sexton, I thought played pretty well okay. for Utah for stretches this year. Sure. There are defensive deficiencies that come with Colin Sexton, and you just kind of have to work through that and manage that. Again, his contract does line up well with the Russell contract, with the Rui contract, if Russell decides to opt in. 18 million for basically like all three of those guys. That's just like a name and a number that works, though. You'd have to add if you're the Lakers onto that because Sexton, you know, averaged 19 points a game and five assists. And I thought his like decision making tree got a little bit better in terms of limiting terrible shots at times this year and and, like throughout the course of last year at times as well. Like, I don't want to just say that, you know, he is who he is, but I, I thought Sexton had like a pretty good year. And I think that like his, His style of getting paint touches could be intriguing for the Lakers, at least off the bench. You know, if you have if you have Chris Paul, you know, getting paid the minimum and you have Colin Sexton in, I think that gives you like some optionality at the point guard position next to Austin Reeves is like your secondary creator. And then you try and find like a three and D two way wing like a Dorian Finney Smith. But to me, these are moves that you can make with multiple first round picks. They have three first round picks available to trade. I think that you can kind of like Frankenstein this thing together almost using multiple moves as opposed to trying to do one superstar trade that works for, you know, across the board. No, I agree with that as well. I I think it's just whenever we're trying to do those, the names you try to come up with aren't always as easy right like coming up with three names that fit exactly into this because we don't know who's going to be a free agent who's not who might be available via trade especially in this type of market in terms of you know not not your top tier players Mm. type of thing but some of these lower tier players and and again the russell thing kind of convolutes all of it because you just don't know what he's going to decide or or how they feel about him as well. Like, I think that's another aspect of this is we may feel one way about D'Angelo Russell, but how does Darvin Ham and the organization feel about D'Angelo Russell? Does what does what Darvin Ham think matter in, you know, a week from now? I don't know. We're, we're going to put a plug in the Darvin Ham thing for a second uh, because we're going to talk about that at the end. Um, the other names, you know, the star names that people have brought up, people bring up the Hawks all the time right? The idea that the Lakers and the Hawks could come together on something for Trey Young, for DeJounte Murray, for something along those lines. I The more I think about that, the less I like it, to be honest, because a big thing for the Lakers this year is that they struggled with point of attack perimeter defense. And I don't think DeJounte has like returned to that level. And Trey Young is obviously a real issue there. And again, like I say, this is somebody that just like advocated for Colin Sexton on some level, right? But Colin Sexton is not their level of star. And it's easier, I think, to manage expectations with somebody like that than it is previous all-stars, all-NBA guys like Trey Young, DeJounte Murray, etc. Uh, look, I'm, I'd be willing to like hear out a trade package, but I, I don't. I don't love it off the top of my head, at least. I mean, so in that scenario, you're essentially thinking like, hey, we're upgrading DeJounte is an upgrade over Austin Reeves or Trey Young's an upgrade over Austin Reeves. But then like everything around it's not going to be nearly as good as what we're talking about, right? Like you're sending out Austin Reeves plus like you're sending out all of your ability to do these moves around the margin. And so then it's, you know, is De- is Dejounte, LeBron, and AD good enough with not all minimum guys, but you know what I mean, like guys that maybe don't fill out this roster. I, I just I don't know that it's enough of an upgrade. Where if there's a path to upgrade the rest of the minutia around it, then I guess I would entertain it a little bit more. But I, I just I would hesitate to do that when unless i could see that for sure like these are the guys that are going to fill the three and d especially if it's trey like how how many guys at the two and three can you fill in now that can space the floor and really really defend yeah no i agree 
I want, again, like my goal here is paint touches to try and minimize the burden on LeBron and a two-way three and D wing. Like the Hawks, if you could go get like DeAndre Hunter for Rui, look, similar in a lot of respects where like they're a little bit disappointing in some regard and they're not as good of shooters as what you want them to be. Uh, Hunter will make shots. He just can't really get them off of volume because the release is a little bit elongated and long and it takes him a minute to get the shot off in terms of like loading into it. Defensively though, I think Hunter is better than Rui, which gives you a little bit more optionality. Like if you could do Rui and stuff for DeAndre Hunter, like, That's kind of interesting. But if you're doing that, if you're the Hawks, I think your goal is to like try and get off the DeAndre Hunter money, like full scale. And like that doesn't really do that in the same way. It does reduce the years that you have guaranteed to that player type, which is interesting, but it doesn't like it doesn't give you a lot of answers necessarily. I don't think in terms of like reducing your tax burden long term uh, or in the short term. I was trying a- to any think, other, yeah, any well, other the, names that come to mind to you? No, I was just trying to think of like any teams that had wings that I like. Like I was trying to think of like the Washington Wizards, but I don't think they'd have any reason to get off Denny or Kispert no. or any of those guys. You know what I mean? Well, and so Kis- Kispert is an interesting one because you could make the case that like, okay, maybe they just don't want to pay Corey because sure. Corey's coming up for an extension. But and they have Bilal them, and they have I, – I guess my thought was if they draft another wing, depending on where they land in the draft, right? Like let's just say they land at a spot where they have to take Zachary Risa because he's fallen to them at five, and that's the pick. So you have Risa Shea, you have – I mean, Kuzma's on that roster, obviously. Kispert, Denny, Bilal. Like you just say like, hey, let's sell high on one of these guys. Kispert and Denny Advia are two guys that I'm just really high on as a fan of the NBA – and so as we're talking about these, we always look at contenders and stuff, but I, I just don't know what the Lakers would have that would make sense for them. Like, why would they send them yeah. to the Lakers for something the Lakers would offer? So that I don't think that gets anywhere. Yeah. Um, the other piece of this, this that is interesting, twofold beyond the coaching staff, and we'll get to the coaching staff here <laughs> right after that. First... They have this year or next year's pick. That is a New Orleans Pelicans decision that they will make based on, you know, probably trying to go through a little bit of some pre-planning here over the next couple of weeks and making a decision on what makes sense for them. The Lakers don't have any control over that, though. Uh, Doesn't affect the number of picks that they have to trade. Uh, They still have three picks to trade if they want to move them. It just affects if the pick is this year or not. Uh, If you made me bet right now, based on things, I would guess that the Pelicans extend that out to next season, given the strength of this draft. Okay. Max Christie is also a free agent here. I am still generally a Max Christie guy. I would have Max Christie ranked higher in the organizational hierarchy than I would Jalen hood Shafino. I would want Max Christie to return. I don't know what a number for Max Christie looks like. Just kind of point blank. We haven't seen him play as much as what I think he probably should. I think he does tick potentially some of the boxes of being an intriguing 3 and D guy. He just turned 21, though. He's just quite young. This is why drafting extremely young players, as well as giving them two-year deals like they did with Taylor Horton Tucker and Austin Reeves, but Austin Reeves is older, drives me completely crazy. And it's like a complete and utter like misstep by this front office in terms of like organization. You have to make a decision on Max and pay before you know exactly what he is. And that's what's really complicated there. If I was like the Spurs, I would absolutely give Max Christie like real money. Like, like I would be like, Hey, we will give you, you know, six or $7 million a year for two years and do like a three year kind of like what the Paul Reed deal was last year, kind of, and like make it like super weird and kind of poison pilled. Um, I would be intrigued if I was the Spurs though, just because I want like potential three and D wings next to Victor. And I want to take as many 
shots on that as I can, kind of. Yeah, I mean, again, like you're talking to a team like Detroit Pistons, like a guy that can defend and space the floor around Cade Cunningham, perfect. So, yeah, I mean, if I'm the Lakers, that, that's a really good point yeah. in terms the, of the Pistons. Like the Pistons should do that. Like yeah. that is that is an interesting move for them. They have sixty uh, well, million dollars in cap space. Like, who cares if a few mil six millions tied up for a little while? Like, who cares? Yeah, that's easy. That's really easy. Like, if you if you do something like, you know. Yeah, no, that's that's way too that's smart to me. They should do that. Yeah, absolutely. And so if I'm the Lakers, I, I'm with you. I would want to bring him back, but they may have put themselves in a situation where, oh, the the young Pistons who aren't going to win anything anytime soon want to overpay Max Christie to maybe hit on something here. Well, we can't afford to match that because we got to have money for over there. And so, like I said, like I said, it's just it seems like they've fumbled the bag on so many of these with Caruso and Horton Tucker. And now Chris, like you said, it's maybe Christie doesn't end up being a dude, but you didn't even give yourself time with him under contract to really find out. And that's the miscalculation yeah. unless they just know, like maybe they just know like, Hey, he's, he, he's not good enough. We've seen it for two years. We know, but as you said, he's very young. He has this archetype, proto, you know, of what he could be, what we've talked about. I would want to keep him same as you. If I was the Lakers, but if I'm one of these other teams, I would just outprice them and see what happens. So the other piece of this that gets a little bit tricky is they're like right now projected like 10 million below the second apron. And as we know, the second apron gets complicated once you start getting into, you know, maneuverability. If somebody gives Max Christie real money, I think think that there is a real chance they kind of have to let him walk yeah. just to keep like flexibility under the second apron, depending on what the money is at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, it, it, that gets, it gets tricky for them unless that like, unless they, you know, D'Angelo Russell declines his player option and it's just like all good. If D'Angelo declines his player option, like they can do whatever they want kind of, but if he decides to take it, and I am fascinated by that. Like, I truly don't know what that'll look like. There are just a lot of potential options there, I think. Yep. The other piece of it that is tricky as well is LeBron. So LeBron makes 50 million now. If LeBron decides to take, okay, I'm going to do three years, 120. Well, it reduces the amount of money that is on the books for this year. It gives them some more space to operate below the second apron. I feel like LeBron has never, you know, taken substantially less like that I, I can see a world where he takes like a little bit less to lock in more money down the road i can't see him taking like drastically drastically less well lebron's we always said that it's his obligation to all the other players to make the most amount he can and and that's something like i don't always agree with lebron says but i understand this the one where this is a little bit different is like he's not the best player in the world. He's not the best player in the NBA right now. He's not a top five player in the NBA right now. So it's not a top five player in the NBA taking less. It's a top 15 player in the NBA. Yeah. And I'm not saying like, Hey, go play for $20 million. It's like, Hey, instead of maximizing whatever 50, you know, whatever, maybe it's 45. And, and that makes a little bit of difference, especially like you say, if the Lakers are like, Maybe there's one extra year on there that makes them a little uncomfortable, but you get some cap relief and flexibility in the meantime yeah. for the first couple of years of it. Okay. The, the final thing here is Darvin Ham. I, I think they have to get rid of him. I think that he's got to go. I understand that, you know, he took them to the Western conference finals last year. I understand that he is, uh, you know, he's been successful, by wins and losses and things like that. But like, if you just watch them, there were so many strange rotational decisions this year involving Torian Prince, involving Cam Reddish. They're like, they took Austin Reeves, like out of the starting lineup for a minute there. They also forgot like, to put him back in the game last night. Austin Reeves had to ask to go back in the game because like they just forgot about him on the bench or something. Yeah. And then he goes and drops like four buckets, has like two assists late in the game. Like it was pretty important. Uh, the whole thing was very bizarre. I think you have to move on from Darvin Ham. Like what coaches do you look at? Look, so like Mike Budenholzer is like a great name, but Mike Budenholzer and Darvin Ham are very close. So like if he sees like what's happening to Darvin in LA and like, doesn't like it. It could get a little bit complicated there. 
uh, Darvin Ham, obviously from the Mike Budenholzer coaching tree. Other names, I mean, it's it's hard, man. Like, it's really hard to know, like, you know, around the league. Like, I, like I saw people bring up J.J. Redick this morning. I'm just like, sure, like, I love J.J. I think he's, you know, a basketball savant, and I'm intrigued to see how that would go, but. That would be fascinating, I don't, though, right? Like, those two guys do a podcast podcast together right now. This would be amazing drama if they hired J.J. Redick. It would be yeah, incredible. Like, and he's interviewed for the Hornets job yeah. and like, I, I get it that he wants to coach. And I, I think the world of JJ Reddick's like basketball intellect, it's just coaching's a different beast and we don't know what he will be like, no. I, I, like I, I think he could be great. I think he, you know, could not be great. I, I just don't know. And to me, if I'm LeBron and I'm the Lakers here in this last little section of LeBron's career, I wouldn't know if I would want to take that risk. It's just that I I think that they're, you know, uh, it could work. It could not work, I guess. I will say this. One thing I learned from this last offseason with the, the Detroit Pistons coaching search is I know even less about coaches than what I thought I did. And, and I will readily admit that, you know, coaches is not something I like really hone in on. You know, I, I watch a lot of games. I have my notes, like all of that stuff. I thought Monty Williams was a home run hire by the Detroit Pistons. Like he was the big name out there. They paid him a bunch of money. He had this track record, like all of this stuff didn't go well in year one. Point being is like, I, I don't know enough about some of these guys demeanor. I don't know about how they carry a locker room, which guys are good with superstars, which guys are good with younger players. What's the history of some of these guys? I, I think those are only answers you know if you sit in an interview room with them or you've been in a locker room with them. Like we can say heat culture and all that, but do we really know what that means? Do we know what heat culture is in a locker room? So, like, I, I just I have a hard time saying this coach would be the best fit. Like, maybe there's some X's and O's and schematic things people could pinpoint with guys. But we know how hard it is to massage LeBron's ego and him taking over a huddle and screaming at you for not, you know, uh, doing the, the challenge, all of the, which coach best handles that Sam, if you can answer me that, then I'll tell you, that's the guy they should hire. I don't know what, I, I don't know if we know who that guy is or yeah, girl or I, girl. I agree. Uh, it's, I, I just would not bring back Darvin ham is where I'm at. 